would be great help for me if you want to keep your Bibles open at Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Uh, there's also a little outline as well, which you might find uh, useful as we look at the section of the Bible uh, together. Um, it is part of the way through a teaching series, uh, which we've called Together, and this is an opportunity for us to look at this wonderful book of the Bible, Ephesians, and hear what God has to say to us. So let's pray for the Spirit's help as we, with God's word open, uh, seek to hear from our good and gracious God. Let's pray. Uh, dear Father, we thank you so much for your kindness again today in so many ways, and we pray, Father, that you keep us attentive, expectant, as we listen to your precious word. And we pray this for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There are many areas of our life where it is easy to disagree with other people. Um, you could pick uh, lots of different topics and areas where it's just so easy to disagree with other people. Let me give you an example. I remember buying this jacket um, in the Christmas sales a few years ago. It was uh, after Christmas. We were in Doncaster, staying with Vicky's mum and dad. And uh, I thought it would be a good idea um, to take the uh, family, so Vicky and the three children, uh, into the city of Don the, it is now a city, isn't it? Uh, to the city of Doncaster to shop for a new jacket for me. I thought it would be a good use of time. I thought everybody would love it. I thought that we'd all love the experience of going around shop after shop, of watching me try jackets on. What else could a kid want to do after Christmas? So we did it. And um, we started off. And remember, I have no fashion sense at all. And so I don't know what I'm looking for. And uh, we went from one place to the uh, We went from, no, that's not, that's not nice. Next place, come on, kids, drag, drag, drag. Uh, this place, no, um, that's horrible. OK, next point, I think this is really nice for me. No, you look like a fool. Um, <laughs> next place, by this time, OK, you're dragging the kids again and again and again. Um, so it's cold, it's December, it's Doncaster. We got to the, the, the other place, and I think everyone was fatigued uh, and ready to, to call it a day. And I tried this on, and I thought, oh, this is nice, isn't it? This is really, really nice. Now, I realize this is a bit of a Marmite jacket. Uh, Marmite people either love or hate, if you ever tried Marmite. This is the same sort of jacket. Uh, and I said it to my family, I said, this looks really good, doesn't it? And at this point, they had lost the will to live. <laughs> So at this point, whatever I had tried on, it could have been pink, it could have had <laughs> dots on it, but I got the response I wanted to hear, get it. <laughs> right? However, they all hated it, they think it's horrible. Even this morning, before I put it on, Vicky tried to encourage me not to do it. So there we go, you can tell me afterwards who has the better fashion advice. Um, we, it's easy, isn't it, to disagree. It may not just be about uh, jackets, shopping. Human beings have a remarkable ability to disagree about almost anything. Uh, what curtains will we buy? Which carpet will we choose? Which film will we sit down and watch on Netflix tonight? Come on, we have unlimited choice. And then an hour later, you're still scrolling through. There doesn't seem to be a decision. We disagree about so much. But let me tell you one area where it is pretty much guaranteed to always find agreement. And that is our desire to experience peace. Uh, whether we are talking about peace on an international scale, peace between countries, peace within families, or even peace on a personal scale. Because peace is not just about conflict in the world between countries. Of course, that makes our news and it makes our hearts break. And we want harmony, not just the absence of conflict. We want the presence of joy and harmonious relationships. And we see that in countries. But is it just countries, is it? It's in families where relationships are torn, where there is conflict and there's anger and there's aggression. And if you're a part of it, I know some of you are going through the mill of family breakdowns and family conflict, your heart breaks. And what do you want? Peace. And not just the absence of the conflict, you want there to be restoration and reconciliation. But it's not just even in families, it's within our hearts. We seem to have an increasing generation that has grown up to be fractured within themselves. They don't seem to know who they are. They don't need to know their purpose or their significance in the world. It seems that they are broken within and they are at angst with themselves. They are not at peace. But it's so elusive they don't know where to find it. Uh, we all want to see peace 
in all those three dimensions, and we want to feel it in our bones in a world where conflict is banished and harmony is present. We all want it. We agree on it. But it seems to be so elusive, doesn't it? It's like water pouring through your fingers. You go home today and you turn on the taps and just try the experiment. Put your hands under the taps and try and catch the water. Or you might get a little bit on your, your cup of your hand, but as you see it pour, you will watch it just seep through your fingers. So many of the world's desires, their abilities, their strategies to try and find peace on whatever scale we're talking about, it is a bit like water through your fingers. We want it, we desire peace, but genuine peace seems so elusive. Well, if you're here this morning or if you're listening online and this is what you want, we'll listen again to these verses from Ephesians chapter 2 and see if you can listen out to the key word. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility, he came and preached what? Peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. It is not hard to see the repeated word, is it? What is the big theme of this short little section? It is all about peace. The same word, peace, is mentioned four times in five verses. And in Bible language, in Bible writing, that is hugely significant. Uh, what we would do today is we would get our highlighter pens out, wouldn't we? And we begin to highlight the key words. They don't have highlighter pens there. So what they do is they repeat the same words in a very small section. Peace, peace, peace. It's a bit like getting your highlighter. It is making us understand what is significant. So the two crucial questions are these. What peace is Paul talking about? The Apostle Paul who's writing this, what peace is he talking about? And secondly, how can we experience it? Well, the first thing he says is this, peace is a person. Do you see that? Verse 14, unmistakably, unashamedly, the Apostle Paul says, Christ, Christ himself is our peace. So Jesus Christ is not like the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, what happens? The Secretary General of the United Nations, they're often sent to try and broker peace between warring nations. Well, the Secretary General may have a part to play in creating peace, but often they're pretty useless because they've got no power. But we would never say that Antonio Guterres is our peace. But that is exactly what the Bible says about Jesus. Isn't it fascinating? We have an organization in our world called the United Nations. Uh, what is the point of the United Nations? It is to unite the nations. The vision is to have the divided nations in our world united together. The whole organization is designed to do it, but it often is futile for them. And then you turn to the Bible, <laughs> and you discover the true way of having the United Nations. But it starts with a person. Jesus is our peace. He himself, not simply that he gives peace or he grants peace, but that he is peace. It is an important reminder for us that Jesus isn't the one who hands out the gifts. No, he is the one in whom all the blessings are found. See, sometimes we are tempted to want what Jesus can give us rather than wanting Jesus himself. Do you find that temptation? You look and think, actually, what I really want from you, Jesus, is all the gifts that you seem to be able to give me, but I, will, I, I think that's more important than you. But the Bible here is drawing us back again to the central truth that Christ himself is what we need. Peace is what we want. Christ provides it. It is all in him. So it should not be like the grandparents coming to visit their grandchildren at Christmas. Maybe you are. Some of you are grandkids 
Uh, not, not grand, well, some, I don't think you're grandkids, some of you, but uh, some of you are grandparents, and you maybe have known that experience, and you come laden heavy with all your gifts that someone has wrapped up for you, and you come through the doors, and what do you really want? Of course, you want your grandkids to enjoy all the presents that you bought, but actually, when you go through the door, what is the first thing you really want? You want them to come and say, hey, I love you. I'm so glad you're here, but so often our experience is different, isn't it? Oh, great, you brought the gifts. Fantastic. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> no, actually, you want to connect the two, don't you? You want to connect the person and the gift. And the Bible says what we want is peace. And the Bible says that Christ himself is our peace. Uh, let us not treat Jesus like a divine version of Amazon. The best person, the best way to get our hands on the spiritual stuff. No, uh, let us desire him First and foremost, let's appreciate that everything else we need is found and experienced when we are personally connected to Jesus. He himself is our peace. Now, what kind of peace is found in Jesus? There are two types of peace that get mentioned here, peace with people and peace with God. First, peace with people. Listen again to verse 14. Uh, For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create, notice the language, this is creation language, to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. The great purpose of Jesus Christ is to create one new humanity. Here is the New Testament equivalent of the book of Genesis, isn't it? Genesis, there's a creation of the humanity. This is the creation of the new humanity, and the new humanity is people from different places united together in Jesus Christ. That is what our hearts want. The United Nations wants it. We want it to work. We want diversity in unity, and the good news of the Bible is it is possible, but it is only possible in Jesus Christ. Uh, How has he done it? Uh, The Bible says here he has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, or in the words of verse 15, he has set aside in his flesh the law, talking about the Old Testament law, with its commands and its regulations, okay? So what you had before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there was a divide between the Jewish people and the Gentile people. And here we have the law being referenced here. You see, the Old Testament law Uh, with all its different categories, whether the moral law or the ceremonial law or the ritual law, all of the law divided Jews and Gentiles. So the Old Testament law kept Gentiles from coming in. Oh, yes, they could come in if they decided they would become Jews. But they would have to become Jewish. They would have to take on all the traditions. What they couldn't do is the Gentiles couldn't come into the Old Testament people of God, stay as Gentiles, stay with all their cultural traditions. They had to change and they had to become Jews. And so therefore, the Old Testament law, if you like, kept Gentiles away. But it also kept Jews from going out. Because the Jews couldn't easily go and spread this news about their God to all parts of the world because the very law with all their ceremonial and all their rituals prevented them easily from going out. So you had this system where the Gentiles were prevented from going in and the Jews couldn't really go out. And so therefore you see something has got to change. And what happens at the coming of Jesus Christ is that he sets aside the law of God, but he does it in a very particular, even though it is an unusual way. It says here he does it in his flesh. So Jesus Christ doesn't come into the world and say, oh, all those commandments, all those regulations, a load of nonsense, let's get rid of them. Get your scissors out and cut them out of the Bible. No. He sets it aside in his flesh. The Son of God, the eternal Son of God, takes on human flesh. That's called the incarnation. And this enables Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to do at least three things. In his flesh, he keeps the law. He keeps it all perfectly. No one has ever done that before. Every single commandment in God's book in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, in the flesh, keeps perfectly. He keeps it. Uh, But secondly, he fulfills the law. All the shadows are now fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. All the sacrificial system, 
All the animals brought uh, to, to be sacrificed for the sin of the people. This was all required because the people were sinners. They had to have a way of atonement. So what's going to happen next? Has Jesus said, no, you're not really sinners. No, he doesn't say that at all. He comes and in his flesh, he fulfills all of it. All the sacrifices in the Old Testament are pointed to whom? The Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. So in his flesh, he becomes the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament law. And he, if I put it like this, he suffers the law. Not the law is a bad thing, but the law has its penalties. It has its penalties for those who are lawbreakers. Yes, there is an expectation that you'll be a law keeper, but if you're a lawbreaker, there are penalties. And what does Jesus do in his flesh as he goes to the cross? He takes in himself the penalty for all the lawbreakers. And so therefore, together in his flesh, he fulfills all of what the law is pointing to, which means that in Christ, in Christ, that law can be set aside. Jews and Gentiles can now, in Christ, perfectly keep the law even though in themselves they are lawbreakers. It is incredible. Which means, because Jesus Christ has done this in his flesh, it is now possible to create one new humanity, united in Jesus Christ, even though we might be diverse in hundreds of ways. Now let me say to you that the way Christ has done this is critical for our unity, for our joy, and our love. So Jesus Christ didn't give the Gentiles a free pass, okay? He didn't say, Gentiles, you're really beyond the pale. We're just going to give you a free pass, and we're just going to forget about the law. He didn't do it in himself. He kept the law. He suffered the penalty of the law, and he fulfills the law. If he had given the Gentiles a free pass, that would have caused upset with the Jews. It is different. It is in Christ himself who has now dealt with the law for both Jew and Gentile. So he hasn't just done it for the Gentiles. He's done it for the Jews. Which means, therefore, in Jesus, joyful unity is possible. It now means that diverse culture can be expressed. People from every nation can come and follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and they don't have to take on the trappings of one culture. Praise the Lord for that. We've experienced it today. It is chaos sometimes, isn't it? But there's a loveliness to bring our cultures, which are neutral according to sin, and to bring them together in the people of God. That is wonderful. The world longs for that, and it is available in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it means there is no place in the people of God for annoyance or upset. We all come on the same terms to the same Savior, and he saves us. Christ is what we need to satisfy the demands of the law. What does that mean for us? Well, let me put it like this. When we struggle to stay together, and there will be moments, I am sure there will be moments, there will be moments when it is joyful. We'll sing, there's no one like Jesus, and we will go, woo, we love it, let's sing it again, all right? There'll be other times when you look around and you struggle to stay here because it'll seem too hard. Now, let us remember when we struggle to stay together that the reason we are together is Jesus. Jesus is our hope. If we cannot move from him, then we cannot move from each other. Because he is our hope. Peace with each other, that's what Christ brings. But secondly, peace with God. I look at verse 16. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Now let me just point out three things uh, from these verses. First of all, notice uh, notice that Paul is talking here about both need peace with God. Nobody's on good terms with God. We're all rebels. We're all sinners. And Christ has come to bring peace for the Jew and the Gentile with God. There needs to be reconciliation. But notice first that Paul says it is through the death of Christ on the cross that Jesus put to death their hostility. I just find that a fascinating phrase. Through his death, he puts to death their hostility. How on earth does that work? Surely the cross was all about Jesus being put to death. How is it that through his death, he puts to death the hostility of the enemies of God? Well, this is how he does it. Because through his death on the cross, he pays the price for those who are hostile. That is amazing. The enemies of God think, what, you're not going to come and blitz us? You have come to sacrifice yourself to pay the price 
for me, wow. And what it does next, it blows open a heart of love in the enemies of God. Because when you discover that the one you have offended has died for you and sacrificed and paid for you, God then by his spirit works a miracle in your heart to end your hostility to the one you offended. The death of Christ ends the hostility in our heart. That's why we sing so many songs about the cross. That's why we must keep the cross central. It is that message that keeps on penetrating our hearts to make us more loving of God. Second, at peace was required by those who were far away and those who were near. Do you notice that? Those first, um, those who are near are the Jews, those who are far away are the Gentiles. It's not that the Gentiles were in trouble and the Jews were okay. No, both need peace. <laughs> One were very privileged that they all had all the Old Testament at regulations, they could have pointed more easily to have peace, but both needed peace. And Christ has come to bring peace to those who are near, the Jews, and those who are far away. I wonder, too, if this has got a secondary application, too, not particularly just to Jew and Gentile, but maybe to those who, who could be far away out of religious circles, but those who are near in that you are religious church core. And whether you are far away, and whether you think there's no place for me in a church community, or whether you are a devoted religious person. Whoever you are, you need peace. It reminds me of the parable of the lost sons. Remember that? It's not the parable of the lost son. How many sons does the father have? Two. We often focus on the first one, don't we? The younger son, he goes away. He goes far away, doesn't he? He goes far away, he squanders his life, and then he has to come back, and he doesn't think he's going to be accepted, and he gets blown away by the Father's generosity and love. Here I am, Pastor James mentioned this the other week, took us to that parable, but there's another son, isn't there? Is he far away or is he close? He's near, isn't he? But how many sons are lost? Two. The other son, the older son, he is very near and yet he's just as far relationally from his father. He is just as lost. But the problem is he doesn't know how lost he is. And then in a moment, as you see his response to the younger, his younger brother who comes home, when the anger bursts out, you see all the self-righteousness, and it exposes that he is lost. I don't know who you are, but if you are someone who is far away or someone who is close to religious things, be careful that you don't think you are too far away to be helped. Christ can help you, but also be careful that you don't think you're too close to need help. We all need Jesus Christ. And then last of all, did you notice it, it says here that Jesus came and preached peace to those who were far away and those who were near? So it's not just that peace was won, it's not just that Christ is peace, it is that this peace is preached. And notice who does the preaching? I love this. Christ preaches to those who are near and those who are far away. And you think, how does he do that? Because obviously in his ministry, um, he was mainly, if not exclusively, with the people of Israel. He was preaching to those who were near. How on earth did Jesus preach to those who are far away? Ah, through us. So as we get sent and scattered into the world as the followers of Lord Jesus Christ, and as we, in our little stumbling way, utter words about Jesus, the Messiah, and you know how easy it is to stumble and fall, but as we articulate the good news about Jesus, we spread this peace. Do you know whose voice has actually been spoken through our stumbling little voice? The voice of Christ. The voice of Jesus. Jesus Christ is using his people, and he preaches through us. That's amazing, isn't it? In John chapter 10, Jesus talks about he has sheep and another pen, and they're going to come, and my sheep will hear my voice. How will they hear the voice of the shepherd? As those who are saved by the shepherd go and bleat. <laughs> Let me tell you about Jesus. But behind our little voice is the voice of the good shepherd himself preaching peace to those who need to hear it. So, my brothers and sisters, let's be inspired, okay? Let's be inspired to keep on spreading the news of where this peace that people long for can be truly found, and let's keep inviting people to put their faith in Jesus, maybe today, to put your faith in Jesus, because that is how you become in Christ, and that is how we can all experience the peace we crave. Let's pray.
So just a moment as you reflect, as you ponder what God has said to you today. Dear Father, we thank you that Christ is the Prince of Peace. Thank you that peace is found in him. Thank you for the mighty work of reconciliation, both vertically and horizontally and internally. And we pray that we would praise Jesus and spread the news of peace uh, through his help with the power of the Spirit for the glory of his name. Amen.